As you know, uh, Father Martin, uh, if you recall, I made a, a, a pilgrimage. Uh, I know. I went to the Vatican. Yes. And I went to the Sistine Chapel, and I did all the things that one does. And, and by the way, uh, Father, it was very interesting. When we arrived at the Vatican, mm -hmm. uh, there was a massive, massive crowd there. And we were kind of looking around saying, wow, look at all the people. What in the world is going on? And somebody turned around and said, you mean you don't know? Uh, the Pope's going to be here in five minutes. <laughs> and so we got to watch and listen to the Pope, which I thought was uh, quite a treat. That was just uh, very lucky. Uh, just like it, if you want to call that luck, yes. Um, uh, true. Good point. Then we went to the Sistine Chapel. And though we did not get an opportunity to go to the Labyrinths, uh, mm -hmm. beneath the Vatican, uh, Father, I must tell you, the Sistine Chapel is in itself something of a labyrinth. Oh, it is. It <laughs> is. I, I, you can, I, I have lain on my back looking at the ceiling for hours, after hours when I could do that, just looking at the ceiling. I fully understand. I fully understand. You come out of there, uh, out of this long labyrinth, uh, with a crook in your neck because you've been looking up all the way. That's right. That's right. <laughs> but here's what was really unusual, Father. Um, my wife is a Catholic, as you know, mm -hmm. Ramona. And um, w the, as soon as we walked into the Sistine Chapel, the first thing we saw was this gigantic globe. And... Yeah. You know what was on the globe? Uh, it had all 12 signs of the zodiac. That's right. I couldn't believe it. <laughs> I couldn't believe it. I, I was so amazed that I had Ramona stand there and point to her birth sign on the globe, and I took a photograph and put it up on the website. It's up there <laughs> right now. And I was going to come home and ask you, what in the world is something astrological doing in the Vatican? Well, actually, art... Uh, it's a historical fact that several popes over several centuries always kept an astrologer. Really? Oh, yes. Uh, and the astrologer was noted for his Catholicism. It was always a man. And, um, and they consulted him about the affairs of state, whether it was advisable to do this, to that, to the other. Really? For, a year, for hundreds of years. Oh, now, yeah. somehow I'm a little lost here, Father, because I always thought that the only person a pope would would consult with yes. would be God in prayer, and that the influence of the planets wouldn't enter into it. Well, not, not with Cosal I know, well. strictly speaking, one would expect that, but they, they, they considered it a one way in which God would advise them to do things. A wise Catholic astrologer would be studying the movement of the planets uh, and would see in the conjunction or the separation or the rearrangement of the planets yes. an indication of favorableness for this move or that move on the part of the Holy Father. No kidding. Yeah. Do yeah. you know that tonight as we speak eight planets are in alignment? Yes, I was told that. I haven't got out to look at them because I've I really have something else to do, uh, much less present than watching the planets, because I'm terribly interested in the stars, but I would love to see them. That is, that is um, absolutely remarkable. Now, what is the, the modern uh, church's attitude with regard to astrology? It depends on the modern churchman. The, the, certainly the present Holy Father does not consult, uh, has not got and does not consult astrologers. Um, the... It, there is nothing inherently against Catholic teaching or Catholic faith in astrology, provided that you uh, see it all beneath the hand of God. Because, uh, the, the, again, the Catholic doctrine is that God can manifest his will and tell you what to do in your life through various material happenings. And one of them is the arrangement of the planets. Uh -huh. So it, it, there's nothing against faith. What is would be against faith is one placed all one's trust in that and uh, relied on that to be the deciding factor about life and death. And that's forbidden. That nevertheless seems to be a very liberal interpretation. Yes, partic it is. Particularly for uh, popes of, of many years ago. I know, for hundreds of years, Art. Hundreds wow. of years, literally. Certainly... You could say that between, um, say, as a cliché date, 1200 
and the middle of the 1600s, it was very common, very common. <laughs> Well, then I think the, uh, the church is to be applauded for not erasing history that perhaps today it would not rather recall. That's right. That's right. And actually, yeah, they don't emphasize it nowadays at all. And besides, you see, nowadays uh, astrology has become the, the purview of people who, who don't believe in God, at least according to the Catholic faith anyway. So they emphasize it less. And then there have been abuses of astrology, of course. Um, there, there are stories and novels and books and real uh, factual histories about people who consulted the stars and therefore decided to go and assassinate somebody or to steal something. Sure. So that's where it goes over the edge. But as a means of knowing God's will, no, some folks wouldn't travel without their astrologer. Ah, uh, that's really, that's really Would an amazing thing. Would not travel without <laughs> Um, all right. Uh, it's then, surprising art. There's no doubt about that. In, indeed. Uh, and then, then there were um, a couple of other things that struck me and will be with me for all of the rest of my life. Mm. I, I think, no, I believe in God, Father. Sure. But I am skeptical about things that I can't touch and prove. I can't help it. Yeah. Uh, sure. However, while I was there, I also got to go to Bethlehem, and Jerusalem. And ah, I, I, I interesting. Saw, yeah, and I saw the exact place where Christ was born ah. and where uh, the final crucifixion took place. And I must tell you that along with my experience in uh, North Africa, I, yes. I, there are almost not words to describe the difference between talking about it, hearing about it all your life in Sunday school, early in Sunday school, but then suddenly being there and being in that spot, and you know that you are, you really, really know, and I can't even convey in words. I know you can't, and nobody can, Arden. I know exactly what you're talking about. Uh, there's no way you can tell it, but there's some, there's something in that place. Oh, in boy. Those places. Oh, boy. Is there ever. Yeah. And you know, Art, look at it in a broad level for the moment. Uh, take a broad, even a broader view of it. If you go and visit the battlefield of Waterloo, Belgium, right, or the Alamo in uh, Texas. Sure, something grips you there. Some of the same sort of feeling, but not nearly as strong. Oh no, it's not nearly as as awesome. Awesome as the word. Um, it's awesome. I, I guess that's the best word you can come up with. But I really haven't found words to convey to my audience, and I really have tried. Yeah, I'm sure you have. <laughs> so I was. Uh, it was. It was an amazing. If you thing. couldn't do it. It means it's rather difficult because you are a master of words. There really are some things that words. There, there are not words for. That's right. They, they go beyond. The feelings are too deep, and the experience is too real. Um, human words. It just. It's. It's like it. It drives something right through you. Uh, it and does. I, I'm going to leave it at that because I really can't explain it. No. Um, so okay. anyway, that was incredible. But uh, I'm so glad. I'm so glad you saw those places. Then, after I called you the other day, Father, yes. and I found out, uh, happily, you were not dead, mm -hmm. the next night, uh, it was, I think it was, uh, I think it was Sunday, yes, on, on uh, 60 Minutes, uh, lo and behold, yes, they put a picture of your book, Hostage to the Devil, that's on right. the screen in connection with a story they ran. That's right. And By Dr. Olson. And Dr. Olson. I think I had given you the first news of that, and I'll bet lots of other people have talked to you about it since. Since, yeah, but you were the first. <laughs> you were the first to tell me about it. <laughs> and I, 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 my eyes popped out of the place when I saw it. All right, to give everybody some sort of uh, background, uh, this re is with regard to a 60 minute story about a lady with multiple personality disorder, um, a Wisconsin woman. Um, who went to a doctor, and uh, the doctor said she had 126 different personalities, distinct and different personalities. Over many years, he treated her, Dr. Kenneth Olson, and the allegation is that he hypnotized her and that he actually put these personalities into her, including the bride of Satan, teenage boys, you name it, she had it. It cost hundreds of thousands of dollars in insurance money hypnosis again and again and again over years and years and years and then finally culminating in this psychiatrist performing an exorcism I know, I know they said based on your book 
a hostage to the devil. Right, using the formula put in the, in the back of that book. And, uh, by the way, uh, he thought, I guess, that it was a success, that it uh, had successfully exorcised her. Yeah. Uh, and so there's a lot of legal battling and uh, lawsuits pending and so forth and so on uh, over all of this. But I thought I would try and get your reaction to that. Well, I'll tell you my reaction, Art, is this. It's, and don't be very surprised at this. My reaction is great fear for the safety of Dr. Olson. And I'll tell you why. Okay. Um, the essence of exorcism, performing an exorcism, mm -hmm. is a clash between the exorcist and the demon allegedly possessing somebody who is to be exorcised. Yes. And it's not a, simply a prayer, and it's not simply a blessing. It is an actual battle. Clash, it's like a conversation. battle. Conversation. Like a battle. Yeah. And you can only do that according to the, the, the theory, the belief. You can only do that with immunity because you're facing, allegedly, according to faith, you're facing an archangel albeit a fallen archangel called Lucifer and uh, that archangel has uh, an intellect and resources far beyond anything any human being commands and in order to tussle with him, tangle with it or him or it or whatever we want to call it because he has no gender right. in order to do that you have to have the authority to say what is your name? Why are you here? When did it start? I can get out. And in order to do that, you have to have permission. And that's why we always counsel people, uh, never on their own back, to tangle with anything really demonic. Because if you do, you're going to lose. And uh, if, if, I, if, I, if I could talk, which I can't, on account of uh, privileged communication, I could tell... Uh, very, very scary and awesome stories, uh, frightening stories about psychiatrists who did try and exorcise without any authority and became possessed themselves. Oh, really? Yeah. They, I mean, they, they tackled an enemy far stronger than they with no immunity, no authority. Well, remember in past shows, Father, people have called and said, I have done exorcisms. Lay yes. people. Lay people. Yeah. And you have said, yes, it is possible. It is possible. But is apparently possible. very dangerous. It's very dangerous, and I don't know what, with what authority they did it. I do know one Lutheran pastor um, who has authority from his church and successfully exorcises. Uh, it is a very rare thing. You see, the, the only proof is that this, the person uh, in question is completely healed completely healed and art let me tell you there is no healing more peaceful more lovely more joyous more confident more human than the healing of somebody by exorcism it is so beautiful it's like a sunrise on a calm upland meadow after a devastating hurricane well, the people who would defend the doctor, I'm sure, would say that he did this as a final resort. Oh, yes, I'm sure. I'm How, sure however, would. his detractors would say he's the one who put the 126 different well, personalities into her in the first place. The reality is something else. And as you know, Art, you're a very well-read man and a studied man in this matter. The whole theory of MPDs, multiple personality disorder, yes. is very much, for the psychiatric community, very much up in the air. Oh, very much. Uh, yes, uh, the, the suggestion being that under hypnosis, uh, these are induced by, that's the, right. by, by the psychiatrist. That's right. And we do know nowadays, especially since the end of the Second World War and the, the transport of uh, Hitler's uh, mind control experts to this country, Yes, we do know now that programming can be very deep and very effective and can really 
achieve what... Remember that book, The Manchurian Candidate? Of course. It can achieve that, and we do use it. Uh, Father, I want to ask you uh, yes. what, uh, what they call the big question here uh, that I've worked up. Uh, how do you know... I, but Father, I take it you have probably done more exorcisms than anybody else in this country. Is that... I, I don't know. I really don't, because it's a, it's a very compartmented trade, if I can put that. Trade. Yeah, right. Very compartmented profession. You don't communicate. I've just come across uh, a marvelous exorcist who's been functioning in a certain area of the Midwest, and I never knew he existed. Um, it's just we didn't overlap. Understood. We never overlap. So it's like, not talked about a lot, really. Uh, no, it's not. You don't communicate very much because laws of privacy govern everything in this matter because uh, nobody who has genuinely been possessed and genuinely been cured ever wants anybody to know about it. Okay, well, that's, that's really where my question goes. Now, uh, apparently the allegation is this woman had these personalities inserted into her through hypnosis. How do you delineate how do you know that some of the people that you have not performed exorcisms on mm -hmm. are not people who have been victims of this induced MPD? It's one of the things we have been alerted to from, from the mid-70s art because we, so we came across uh, very accurate information about the programmers that do exist, that did exist then and do exist today. And we form criteria, uh, principles by which to judge that. And it, it, it's not a simple matter, but it can be done. And more than once, I have dismissed people who applied for exorcism, saying, no, 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 there's no exorcism here at all. Who is your psychiatrist? Hmm. Or who is your psychologist, or who is your whatever, your guru, your channel, or whatever it was? One would presume that usually prior to coming to somebody like yourself, mm. people would have been to a psychiatrist or two or three. Usually they come to a psychiatrist, actually. A psychiatrist would write to you and say, Dear Dr. Martin, dear Dr. Martin, look, I have a patient, blah, 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 blah. And uh, he or she is the etiology of it all. Would you have a talk with them? Without discussing, without discussing uh, specific cases, Father, yes. how many times have you uh, begun to investigate a possible exorcism and then rejected it? Um, seven out of ten cases. Seven out of ten? Yep. Because, you see, uh, there's also the question of uh, disease. Uh, some people, for instance, with La Tourette syndrome, are used to be confused with possession. Yes. And La Tourette syndrome is just has a lot of the behaviorisms of possessed people, but it's not possession. And then there's Huntington's chorea, and then there are forms of schizophrenia, um, uh, phases of schizophrenia. There yes. are schizophrenia, but not uh, possession. And then, by the way, there are, there are forms of possession that are very like schizophrenia, and the demon hides behind the schizophrenic manifestations. And oh, that's, that's even worse. Yeah, it is. There's a double family there. So you've got to undo all that. And you can only undo all that if you have authority. You can't just do it because you say, well, okay, now tell me what the truth. Are you there or not? <laughs> it's nothing like that. It's a far more... Are you, are, you, are you allowed to discuss the tests? Yes. Yes, the tests are the... <sighs> If you want to start at the beginning, first of all, you 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 ensure that there's nothing physical, that there's no, there isn't a tumor on the brain, there isn't a, a, a transgenerational insanity, there isn't sure. alcoholism, there sure. isn't a drug addiction. You, you must assure yourself of all those things. And if there is, is it is it masking something else, or is it simply that alone? So you've got. To, first of all, you must check them physically. They must be checked physically. Uh, because there are all the physical manifestations out. And then, having done that, you um, check them psychologically. Not by psychoanalysis exactly, but competent psychologists must uh, examine them, talk to them, um, examine them anyway, even if they can't talk to them. Sometimes they refuse to talk. 
and they must make up their minds if uh, it's uh, some form of psychosis or neurosis or something psychological or something that's indefinable and that uh, has no explanation in the, the diagnostic manual for psychiatry. In that case, then, the, the, the attitude is, okay, uh, let's try exorcism. And then you start off formally into exorcism. And that means then talking to the person in question or to the people who know them, if it's a child uh, or a young person or a husband or a wife, etc. People who know them and finding out how they've lived and when it started and what happened and what distresses people, why have they come to you, what has the psychiatrist said. If, if they come to a psychiatrist, usually the psychiatrist will tell you what he or she has found out about them and say this is the baffling thing about it and this is why I will turn to you on a religious plane rather than on a psychoanalytic plane or psychological plane or psychiatric plane. Uh, and therefore you, you eliminate, you eliminate uh, possibilities of disease, physical disease, and you eliminate the possibility of hoax, and you eliminate the possibility of uh, something to do with uh, uh, insanity or uh, psychological uh, Irregularity, of some kind or other. Okay, but once all of that is gone, and then then you make an appointment, to start your exorcism, and um, it, it, it actually art. Once you start into something like that formally, having arranged everything in the usual way, and I can describe that in a few sentences to you. Within ten minutes or twenty minutes, you know if you're dealing with possession. That quick. Oh yeah. Yeah, 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 because you see the, the power of an exorcist. If he has authority, the power of the exorcist is such that it evokes a response. It evokes a response, uh, and the battle begins. The battle begins. If he is skillful, he can be fooled. He can be deceived. Have you been? Uh, no, no, but I've been. Uh, I've assisted at exorcisms when I was younger, where the person was baffled. And deceived, and uh, uh, out, out, out with it, out with it. And I knew it, but I wasn't in charge. And you don't interfere. Outwitted. Yeah, That's outwitted. An That's interesting right. term. Yes, it is. It in, other, in other words, the strength of your faith alone, uh, even if you have absolute faith, might not be enough. You could still be outwitted. That's exactly it. Out. You've got it. That's exactly it. You can be outwitted by. A cleverer mind and a quicker intellect and uh, a more resourceful intellect and above all a much more ruthless intellect which also is probably acquainted with you the exorcist uh -huh. to a certain extent and therefore knows your weaknesses and knows what to tap to evoke uh, false judgments that's really quite remarkable to consider because uh, I suppose the purist would suggest that an absolute rock-solid faith would be sufficient or should be sufficient with God's power behind you. But actually, there's an, there are other aspects, including wit. Uh, in other words, that you you not be fooled by somebody brighter than yourself. That's right. Intelligence. Intelligence. There's, wow. There's, there's, nothing can beat intelligence when it gets down to brass tacks. Mm -hmm. a, a fight like this because it's a, it's a real struggle um, and they, they, they you see we we humans as such we are inclined to not try it exactly but we're inclined to be very fascinated by some intellectual problem and we can be lulled into accepting a situation where we, we we become we we fall under the influence of uh, a superior intellect because usually not always but usually the demon has a superior mind compared to ours usually usually well that really must make you think several times as you go into an exorcism um, it does because it does. you 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 it is possible and it's happened hasn't it father that uh, exorcists have gone in and haven't come out, they've died. They've, that's right, they haven't, they, they've come out of it and died, or they haven't come out of it and they've died. 
or to come out of it possessed and possessed in a very very pathetic way I mean worn out useless uh, what yet, generally is it when, when that occurs uh-huh. what does the church do well once upon a time when church men bishops in other words and uh, uh, the, the, the prelates of the church when they really uh, were in charge of this because nowadays they're not a lot of them don't believe in it at all but when they had a regular uh, system and a method of uh, taking care of this aspect of life um, they generally gave them very easy jobs as parish priests or in institutes to make it easy because these men after there's no doubt about it that they, they were they, they lost their lives so the church took care of them for the rest of their yes, lives yes it did it was very mild and compassionate with them and uh, and today today well today first of all there are far fewer exorcists than ever before in a lot of dioceses for instance in Detroit in the diocese of, of Detroit there is no formal exorcist mm. at all so if you want to have an exorcism in that area, you have to go to the, 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 the cardinal, it's the cardinal in charge, and say, listen, Bishop so-and-so of such and such a diocese has an exorcist, mm-hmm. may he come in and do it, because he can't do it in somebody else's diocese unless he has authority and permission. And it becomes very awkward then. Sometimes the bishop says no. Sometimes the bishop says yes. Sometimes the answer is very peculiar. Sometimes... A bishop who is not respected very much for his Catholicity is quite willing to experiment. <laughs> hmm. It's very funny. You never know what's going to happen. So, the, so it the, could be in this day and age, Father, that a um, a priest who would perform an exorcism and would come out of it basically a vegetable would yeah. be would not be taken care of by the church. No, would not be taken care of. His family takes care of him, or he goes to a home, or I know one or two who ended up in state farms. Hmm. It, it's a grim affair. It's a grim affair nowadays. All right, I've got something I need to ask you about. What's that? I do a lot of different things on the air, sometimes foolish things. <laughs> I doubt that. Uh, oh, I do. No, I do. I do. I do. And I was. Uh, I wanted to talk to a witch. Uh-huh. A broom riding. I, I said a broom <laughs> riding. Broom riding witch. Yeah, you're. You know the real McCoy, a real yes, witch. Yes. And so I went on a witch hunt. <laughs> Uh, and I found this young lady yeah. who calls herself Harlot. Harlot. And I interviewed this young lady. Yeah. Um, and turns out she called herself a witch, Father, but what she really was was a Satanist. Uh. I interviewed her over a period of, oh, I don't know, about four hours or so, and trust me, she was the real McCoy. She scared me to death, and <laughs> she really scared it out of you. Full of hail Satan's and um, all that kind of thing. Uh, it's extremely serious. At first, I thought she wasn't serious, but trust me, she was. Uh, she was married to a man who killed her daughter. Now he knew, or she knew, that uh, this was coming, and at toward the end of this interview, this four-hour interview, I. I was mind blown, and I I said, you know, has it occurred to you that you obviously willingly are going to go to hell? And she said, yes, I know, I I accept that, I look forward to that. That's right. I said, but your daughter, your innocent young daughter, who was murdered by your ex-husband, um, what about her? She won't be with you. And you know what she said? She said, no, you're wrong because I knew it was coming, and before uh, she was killed, I took steps to ensure she would be in hell with me. And that stopped me cold. At what age was the daughter when she was killed? I can't remember. I was like three or four. Young. Yeah. Well, the terrible thing about it art is, A, a general remark, a, that children through their parents can be made belong to a demon. They can. Through their parents. 
so how, that pen. I, how can that be, Father? In in a world that I guess I don't properly understand. Yeah, it's difficult to express it. Um, but we have cases. We have frightening cases of it. And it, it, by the way, we have also got cases where the par- par- parents, uh, Satanist worshippers, Luciferians, really. Yes. And generational uh, Luciferians, that is, the one in the family, who they tried to do the same to their children and failed. Some children accepted it, some didn't. Well, that would imply an age of understanding, but... Uh, yes, it's extraordinary, the understanding they have, the art. It's frightening at the age of three and a half, four. It's astounding in certain cases. In other cases, no, they're dull. They're like little children, which they are, and they, they don't, there's no harm done. But there are cases, uh, and... Uh, there's some part of me, Father, that just can't grasp this, that an innocent child could be ta- literally taken to hell by uh, the, the, the mother in this case. Cease to be innocent. Cease to be innocent. You see, actually, Art, when you think of it, um, there have been cases in history where children of uh, uh, an age, a tender age, as we say, three and four, turned out to be very willful. There, there are rare cases. I know that. There are very rare cases. But it does happen. But even under the, uh, under our laws, uh, a child of three or four could never be charged with never, never held responsible for in any way never. what that some child at that age would do. That's right. So um, I, I'm sure you get this kind of question all the time. But how could a merciful God allow this to occur to a child that young? How could this woman's will? Um, make that happen I, I I have no answer to that I do know it happens I do know that there's full consent on the part of the child I do know that they have a development of will and mind that frightens you when you come across it Either you, you know you're in the presence of a tiny body which is as developed as your will your adult will although not with the experience and it's a very frightening thing Boy, it's a scary like world. A we live. Dog. You know, I, I sort of half expected you to say, "Don't worry, that child uh, is not in hell." Well, but that is what you said. I, as to who finally ends up in hell, Art, that is something reserved to God. We don't know, and she, the mother, may have thought she may be quite sure about it. She may not have had because the final decision is not hers; it's God's. Yes, but your your answer is she could have done it. Oh, yes. Uh, here once again is Father Malachi Martin. Father, um, welcome back. Thank you. Uh, I've got a really hard question I'm going to ask you, hard for me. But first I want to ask you, in previous programs you and I have done, we have talked not just about people possessed uh, requiring exorcism, but people in a different category, people that you have called perfectly possessed. Now, frequently these people are very successful, have a great deal of money and influence and power. Usually, yeah. Usually, yes. And um, there are many of them. And you said when you walk down the street, you you know them when you see them. Yes, you always do. They know you. They know you. Yeah. In in what manner would you would you know this person? Can you put words to it? Uh, no, it's one thing you can't put words to, to it, but it's, it's uh, the unseen signals. Um, uh, it's, it's like uh, you sense that they sense you are both totally alien to each other. Totally alien to each other. Um, so you you it's definitely beyond hate. it's beyond hate. Sorry, Art, for, con- for interrupting you. It's beyond hate, even. It's it's it's, okay. uh, it's total alien. Uh, nothing in common at all. And um, and it's not a teeth gritting, uh, shivering thing. No, it's not. It's 
it's, I don't know if ever in your life, Art, you were in imminent danger of being killed, not of dying. A lot of people have, like myself, with a heart attack, uh, two, two heart attacks, etc. That's of dying, but of being killed. And there, was, there were only twice, two times in my life, which we can talk about some other time, and not to be dive get the conversation too much, when I, I could have been killed. Killed. Literally. Right. But then when you are in that, when it's certain that unless something happens, you are going to be killed, a strange calm comes over you. Because then it's, it's sure. Mm-hmm. You can't do anything about it. Mm-hmm. You can't escape. Mm-hmm. You can't get out of it. And unless something happens, you're going to be killed. Literally, no, you're not, not sure you're going to die. It's you're going to be killed. And, uh, it's a strange calmness. It's cold reality. And it's, it's beyond the shivering cold. It's, it's just, uh, that's the feeling you have when you recognize them and they recognize you. You know, it's cold reality and it's beyond hate. It's totally a fear nation. Okay, the physically possessed person, if I understood correctly your explanation before, is a person who, in fact, has made a pact with the devil the ultimate. To, be, the ultimate. Uh, to be successful, to get what he wants in the world, whatever reason, uh, maybe even to get a woman. Who knows for what reason he's made a pact with the devil. That doesn't make him perfectly possessed. It just puts him in possession. Perfect possession is something beyond that. Even. But I mean, he's utterly satisfied with his deal. Oh, yeah, deal. completely. completely. Uh-huh. Um, the reason I ask is as follows. Um, I have uh, been in the radio business for 25, 30 years. Mm-hmm. And like many people in radio, for many of the early years, I struggled and, you know, about half starved to death like people do in radio. I mean, that's the way it is. And uh, it's been a passion for me, without question. Great. And, Great. I, like everybody else, um, or maybe unlike uh, so many others, I have been very fortunate, and in recent years, my career has just, you know, skyrocketed. That's right. Thank God. Thank God. Well, yep, thank God. But I've got to tell you, I don't ever recall any time that I said that I'd give anything, I'd give my soul, or anything like that. I don't recall a time like that. No, I'm sure you didn't. But since I've had this much success, there have been some times, particularly, I must say, since I heard you describe the perfectly possessed, when I have worried, did did I do something mentally? Did I make some pact that I'm not consciously recalling? I worry constantly. It's like, yeah. Let me let let, let me let me uh, make a remark about that. Um, perfect possession is consequent on a very conscious step, consciously taken step. It's not something that's that's implicit. Uh, to, to contrast. Make a contrast. We now get young people, 20 somethings or 30 somethings in age, and they do come and say, Look, I, I made a pact with the devil because I needed this job. I needed to be, I needed this woman. I really wanted to marry her, and I wanted to get this job abroad, and I want to get this loan, and, et right. and now I can't get rid of it. That's, that's something else. They were simply very stupid and foolish, and generally they can be helped. And uh, it's a thing they regret. Be perfectly possessed through a certain graduation. It's a gradu- gradual thing. It's not all. It's not suddenly overnight. The devil doesn't appear in the morning with a, a scroll and say, "Sign this, and your 50 years of happiness may you come to hell with me." The yeah. Faustian picture, you know, yeah. Mephistopheles. Yeah, Hollywood. Hollywood. That's yes, right. And get his play, Faust. Um, it's it's not that. It's a gradual thing where the person slowly but surely sees concedes, surrenders their will, every every fiber of their will and therefore of their being, and acquiesce totally in it, and are rewarded by their master, and 
utterly conscious. There's no nothing implicit about it. There's nothing, nothing. It doesn't slid by them. You're you're saying I would know it if that was. Oh yes, case. you'd know it a mile away. You'd know it a mile away. You, I, I think it. that it is a a malady suffered by many people who are successful. They don't fully understand the nature of their success, and sometimes it seems like there are other forces at work. Uh, in other words, you, you question your own success, and, and that's sure. one of the things ever since talking to you that I've been worried about. <laughs> yeah. No, I, actually, you see, the, 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 there's no doubt about it that evil, the evil around us, because there is evil around us as well as good, does make inroads in us through pride and vanity and desire and ambition and lust, etc. Yep. You know, all this kind of, and those make inroads in us, and that does prick our conscience. There's no doubt about that. But the total surrender and acceptance of Luciferian being, because that's what takes place uh, in the perfectly possessed, that is something that cannot be done implicitly or overnight or by accident or be slipped into your life without you knowing it. Oh, no. Huh. No. Huh. I think it's... Um you struggle, uh, you, you know, a lot of people who are just hearing this show and me for the first time think, uh huh, an overnight success. Well, I'm an overnight success that's been at it for about 30 years. <laughs> of, of, overnight. Of overnight. Uh, <laughs> nevertheless, though, the, the real success did come recently in the last couple of years and it has been absolutely astounding and I really, really have been worried. Well, Art, that is, I mean, look at this, from my vantage point, looking on the outside in at you, it seems to be the logical progression of a very devoted and intelligent career in radio, and you've reached a culmination. Now, now, there's this part about it. Nobody achieves the amount of affiliated associates that you have, mm -hmm. and the name you've got nobody reaches that without a special destiny from Christ because not everybody does it and you have a profound influence on millions millions and that means that you uh, 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 from this point of view as a radio man that you are working on universal lines that affect the macro government of people's souls, and that's a responsibility. It really is. I know. It's it. That is that. That is that. For me, that's the telling point. That sure, somebody can work like a dog, work the little bottom off, as they say, and not not get to where you are. But you got there, and that was because you, your destiny was that you were to do that given your talents and given your will and given the opportunities which were given to you. Ob obsession would be a good word. I, I'm obsessed with uh, well, obsession, what I do. I love it. Yeah, I know. Well, obsession, yeah, uh, since we're talking in the context of exorcism, obsession is a very uh, uh, professional word with us. <laughs> so I wouldn't use it about it at all. I, I'd say you're <laughs> utterly devoted. <laughs> Utterly <laughs> devoted, uh, and, and because obsessed is something else. We, Close uh, to possessed, huh? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, yeah. Obsessed in that good sense, yeah. Not even in the Calvin Klein <laughs> meaning <laughs> obsession. <laughs> I could make a joke, sort of a joke. Yes, I could use a joke. <laughs> yes. Yeah, so, so, but I, I, I know it's it's a question of destiny. De facto, your destiny before you were born, before you were conceived, before your parents were married, was such that you would achieve this eminence. And apparently, it fits into God's plan. Oh, I hope that's And I'm not so. saying that to bother you up, not bother you up at all. I'm loading on your shoulders, broader uh, uh, though they may be, a responsibility that ain't easy because he will look you straight in the eye, Art, one day, when you pass over, and say, now tell me, Art, how did you really do? I worried all the way. What do you I <laughs> worried all the way. You know, you, you, you discussed the, the uh, responsibility. I worry all the time about the responsibility. As a matter of fact, I don't think that somebody in my position should have as much influence as I can have. I, it's, it's, it worries me all the time. I know. Well, I'm sure uh, all the other eminent men in various fields say the same thing. And I, 
uh, without breaking confidences, and you speak about me as having worked with two popes, and I did, uh, and uh, I've worked with very eminent men, and behind the scenes, the best of them used to shed tears over their weaknesses. Really? And over their fears. Yeah. And then straighten the hump on their shoulders as they say, and march ahead. That's it, all right. That's it, all right. Uh, let me read you this from the UK News. This just came in today from the United Kingdom News. Yeah. It appears that some of those who have passed over to the spirit world are unwilling to be kept from the pleasures of the flesh. A bl- Listen to this. A Blackpool woman uh, called a priest, two psychics, and a Mormon missionary to try to rid her of a ghost that she claimed regularly sexually attacked her. The attacks began in 1994 when she felt something climbing into bed with her. She claimed it pulled off the towel she was wearing about her head and said it was going to make love to her. Uh, Then she felt a, quote, vile, end quote, sensation, quote, like tiny needles trying to pierce my skin, end quote. Um, What does that sound like to you? Well, I'll tell you. Uh... Coincidentally, coincidentally, I'm dealing with at least two cases of people, one male, one female, who are assaulted, uh, mainly in bed. And the assault is never pleasant, but it is sexual. And there's no doubt about it, there's demonic activity around them, and they've let themselves in for it. They let they, themselves in for it? Yes, they did. They, they made mistakes, they made errors, and they have to pay for it, and they are paying for it, thank God. And they are doing penance, and they're taking good direction, but they have to liquidate. And though it may sound funny to you, not funny, but it may sound peculiar to you, I keep saying to them, look, it's far better that you liquidate here your guilt than that you do it in purgatory. How do you liquidate here your... your, your... By this, that if in this life you get suffering, either uh, physical, physical mm-hmm. and mental suffering. Yes. Uh, I, I don't think there's such thing as physical suffering without mental suffering. But anyway, um, if you do that and you have the grace of God, and you offer it up in union, but this is Catholicism, in union with the pains of Jesus, the Savior, whose pains did save us, then you do merit to liquidate the punishment due to your sins. Penance, actual suffering, mental and physical. That's why, that's why when you haven't got pains and aches, for instance, I've uh, normally got a very healthy body, so if I want to do penance, I've got to fast. Uh, you know, you, you have to devise means of not hurting yourself, but depriving yourself of uh, uh, creaturely comforts, which are perfectly legitimate. Because there is, Christ himself said, these demons are cast out only by prayer and fasting. And it is a tradition in Christianity. And by the way, in Islam too, and in Judaism, but we're talking about Christians and about Catholicism in particular, it is their tradition that by fasting and by doing penance, mm-hmm. you do uh, get rid of demonic influence and you do also do penance for your sins. And there's no doubt about it that if you have a horrible cancer, say a multi-local cancer, in your in your skull, yes. in your brain, and you suffer the pains of it, yes. uh, you can liquidate whatever guilt is due to sins, even though the sins themselves are forgiven. There's always some punishment due to it. That's the doctrine of Catholicism, and it's, uh, it was lost in the Reformation. And yet, uh, Father, people uh, come down with these horrible cancers that give them horrible deaths, all the, all the time, and um, it, it sometimes it seems like the very best people die early. 
uh, such terrible deaths. I know, I know. I, I see it every week of my life. So then, how does that how does that fit in? I, uh, well, it fits in the sense that of course, each one is different. Each person is different, and I I I I've never found two patients reacting in the same way. But it's always a question of how they will take it uh, as the will of God or as simply an affliction, and they count it as a curse. Uh, and they can, though, they can count it as a, a hidden blessing. Um, Father, so uh, we are once again at the uh, bottom of the hour, so just it rest away. Away. Right. Oh, it, it, boy, it just flies by. It runs it? Away. Father Malachi Martin is my guest from Manhattan. And, uh, Father, I have interviewed many uh, people who claim to do past life regressions. Yes. I have interviewed um, many New Age types who claim that they have had near-death experiences, that there is no such thing as hell, that nobody ever goes to hell, mm -hmm. and that in all of their regressions and the thousands of regressions they've done, they've never encountered Oh, well, let me tell you, I've got an article here from the London Telegraph, and I want to read you a little bit about it and ask you about it. Uh, uh, quoting, Terrifying accounts of gravely ill people who claim to have been dragged to the very gates of hell by demons are now to be studied scientifically for the first time by a British psychologist. The existence of so-called near-death experiences, or NDEs, in which dying people report having mystical sensations before being resuscitated is now widely accepted by doctors and scientists. Their cause is unknown, but they typically involve a feeling of deep peace, followed by a sensation of floating up through a tunnel toward a bright light and into a beautiful kingdom. We've all heard that. Continuing, but now it is becoming clear that for some people, NDEs are far from blissful. Instead of a feeling of floating upwards, they report being pulled downward toward a pit inhabited by demons. The experiences of uh, Evelyn Hazel, a London-based art historian, as she fought for life against meningitis, are typical. Quote, I had reached a critical stage in the illness, and I was hovering between life and death. I was aware of being involved in an intense and very real struggle for my life. Uh, she told the Telegraph, continuing the quote, a three-legged being, rather like the Isle of Man symbol, was pulling both my legs down to infinite depths, and I knew without any doubt that if I relaxed and I gave in, I would be dead. I believe this struggle went on for some considerable time, and eventually I managed to break away from whatever it was pulling me down. And so they're doing actual scientific studies now, not on the uh, typical light and light beings and relatives greeting you in tunnels stories, yes. but on people who went the other way. Hell is a real place? Uh, yes, a real place in the sense that uh, it is a place uh, uh, that has a... a you see, every place has a where. You know, if I say, if you say Peru, it's a real place, you say, where is it? It's got, it's got a real location, a real where. We do not know the exact location of hell. Oh, I didn't mean a geographic location, oh, Father. Right. <laughs> okay. No, it has a real, it, it's a real place, yes, it is. We don't know the geographic location of heaven either. Uh, no, we don't, we don't. That's a distinct thing. But I guess my question is, uh, hell is as real a place as heaven? Yes. As real, as real, and so is purgatory. Um, in between, um, it's as real. Now, it is impossible to deny the, the fact, because so many people have had near-death experiences in these, right. of both kinds. It is impossible. We can't explain it exactly. Uh, but it is there. There's no. It does take place. And the, the similarity between the between the NDEs is amazing. It does point to some unity caused by one yeah. thing, mm -hmm. one particular experience that they all have had, and the demonic also. They 
The big difference, the big difference, Father, is that people who have had an experience like this lady uh-huh. uh, don't talk about it. They don't talk about it. I mean, sure, if you go to a place of light and love and you realize that you would be in heaven if you uh, really, really pass on, fine, you can talk about that. Yeah. But if you've been to hell, you're not really likely to... You don't come back and tell us about it. Not really. Unless you come back. There have been cases where, of possession where damned souls do speak. Where damned souls speak? Yeah, do speak through the demon. Uh, but that's a question of they're, they're very very peculiar cases and they're very convoluted cases and they're cases where people uh, made special pacts with the demon but they're very rare but they do come they do they do come back at least they're allowed to talk or communicate I should say uh, and it's all very mysterious and you stay away from it as much as possible as an exorcist but it does come through at times and it's a very disturbing experience, and it never leaves you. Well, I would imagine a lot of priests have, even themselves, uh, in their lives, moments of doubt, moments of doubt about, about, about their own... Uh, very many. Yeah. You're absolutely correct. I would, I would think, though, that doing what you have done, yes. uh, doing exorcisms, yes. um, oh. must enforce your own faith in a way that the, the average priest will never have enforced. That's right. That's right, it does. It does. There's no guarantee that you're going to succeed completely and persevere and go to heaven, but there's no doubt about it. It does reinforce it because you're, you're up against it. You're up against the ultimate in evil. And at the, the central experience for any exorcist, who has done exorcisms, even one exorcism, but anyway, exorcisms in general is this. It is the that 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 that, that memory burnt into you mm-hmm. of total malice. Total malice. And it's very hard for the normal even hardened criminals. They they love somebody, their child or their woman or their mother or their country or but to come across the, a mind which is total malice, nothing but malice, is something appalling. As I say, what it does to you is it freezes you. I'm sure it does. It freezes. And that is something which uh, yeah, does make you immediately think of God's beauty and God's compassion and God's love and of nice soft things and uh, of eternal peace and compassion and holiness and goodness uh, it certainly confirms all that it sends your soul into into a, a wild dance towards God well I would imagine you've had lots of opportunities to see young priests assist you in exorcisms and uh, how do they come out of that generally first time around first time around they come out shaken and they generally they they vomit and sometimes they're incontinent. Mm-hmm. They can't keep it in, the, in them. They, yes. They're, it's little they're affected out of their lives. <laughs> you know, we laugh because it's embarrassing. Um, in fact, the first time I was sister at an exorcism in the United States, I was in bed. I was called up by an exorcist who said, Malachi, my assistant has collapsed. Uh, please come over and help me out. It was in the Bronx. In the Bronx? Yep. Uh, and he had the young man had to ask because it's it's a it's a very it's 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 very unnerving in the beginning. It's very unnerving. This is probably a very frivolous question, but I'm curious. Having done so many exorcisms, is there is there any um, geographic sense to exorcisms in the sense of more? For example, in the, in the large cities, I mean, there you are in New York City, is the biggest. Are there uh, more by percentage, do you think, in the big cities than there are in the... Um... No. It's, 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 uh, I'm sure that it's, it's, uh, it will not meet with the approval of a lot of people, but you, I can pinpoint various cities and various areas in the USA, really? Canada, 
and in Europe where um, there are a disproportionate number a disproportionate number where uh, evil of that kind flourishes it's a funny thing can you name a few I mean we're not we're not going to really harm anybody by naming a few well I think for instance that uh, there's a plethora of such things in Geneva, Switzerland Geneva? Geneva, Switzerland Neutral Geneva? <laughs> Neutral Geneva <Yeah. laughs> uh, I think that um, uh, and I hope that we don't get we don't get assaulted for having said this but it, it does seem that uh, Louisville, Kentucky Louisville has a fair share more than say as far as we know, Santa Fe. Uh, it's, it's, and then there are areas in Manhattan where I wouldn't want to live. Um, uh, and they're not always uh, in Avenue A, B, and C, or in the Bronx, for that matter. <laughs> uh, there are areas, there's no doubt about that. Because the, 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 the presence of evil entertained and accepted and wished and blessed and celebrated means that you have diabolic presence demonic presence that's all about it I live right over a mountain from uh -huh. from Las Vegas uh -huh. now Las Vegas is always uh, generally portrayed in the media and elsewhere as the devil's playground yeah I, I, that's I think you know that's romanticizing I, I, I never I never had, in my whole experience Las Vegas never stood out as a, as a home of the devil's art no <laughs> kidding so in other words it doesn't even stack up against Louisville no it doesn't stack up against Louisville it doesn't stack <laughs> up against Chicago it doesn't stack up against uh, Vancouver uh, you know Vancouver wait a minute Vancouver you say yes it doesn't stack up at all um, but it's, it's it's talking now about the incidence of diabolic interference. Um, it just doesn't. So there really are. Do you have any Do you have any thoughts on why there are hot spots like this? I do not know. I do not know. And it, a few years ago, well, no, was more than a few back in the seventies, we tried to create a profile of the possessable person. Sure. And the profile of the places, but we found out there's, there's no profile. No, it's purely random. Neither education, nor sex, nor faith, nor culture, nor riches, nor poorness, poverty or riches, success or failure, uh, black, white, or sky blue, pink, yellow, or red, or green, whatever the color of your skin was. So then possession is random. It appears to be random. It appears to be random. Yeah, because, listen, Arthur, like you, I know very naughty people. I mean, I know people who who couldn't stand the glare of publicity on their business methods. Sure. And I know, and I have come across uh, ladies of the night. Yes. In the street, I remember once, which I'll never forget, being confronted in, 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 in New York, which I'll tell you about if you want to. And uh, I've, I've, I've known a few people from the mafia who, who certainly... Uh, you know, were rough diamonds and were used for as soldiers. But they were just three naughty people. They weren't possessed. Big difference. Oh, huge difference. Huge difference. Can a prostitute go to heaven? Sure. I remember I was coming home late at night with my brother in the pelting rain. And we were both drenched already, but we had to walk. And uh, we met a prostitute. We were both clerics, by the way, but we were muffled up with raincoats and hats and muffler, etc. Sure. And my brother, who's, uh, who's now gone to God, said to a woman, don't you not know that you're, you're putting your eternal soul in danger? Bill was very sententious. My brother is a good man. And she pulled up her dress and pulled out a rosary beads and a prayer book out of her stocking and said, Father, look, I say these every day. I have five little bastards which priests gave me. Pray for my soul. 
Wow. Wow is right. So wow is wow. It's really... <laughs> Five little bastards that priests gave me? Yes. Yes. That's why I'm dating in the streets, prostitutes. A real problem for the church, isn't it? It is a real problem. And inevitably, in a church that enforces celibacy as a rule, you're going to have the difficulties. And we have it, and we've had a, a terrible rush of uh, pedophilia. I know. In the in the dioceses of the USA and in Canada, by God, and we're not finished yet. It's still going on, and uh, there's a the, the 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 organization of the Roman Catholic Church. My church is has been shaken up and hasn't settled down to anything. Uh, regular yet it hasn't made up its mind about things and uh, a good majority a small majority but a good majority of American bishops would wipe out the whole celibacy thing and allow priests to get married you don't agree with that do you? well I'll tell you something Art uh, and I can only speak from point of view of experience I was a, a chaplain here to the US Air Force in Turkey and um, I remember we used to go to the radar domes that back in the good old days of the Cold War. Oh, yes. Uh, that the, they had ringed Russia with in the Black Sea. Yes. And uh, well, I was always driven by Air Force officers. And, uh, by the way, it was an 18-beer trip. It was so an <laughs> We had to have 18 beers apiece to last out. <laughs> but, um, when, but we had talks. And the men would talk to me about anything and everything. And time and time again they said, Father, look, we would never discuss these matters with you if you were married, like Woody. Woody was the Protestant chaplain. He was a very decent fellow. The intimacy that celibacy allows a priest, because he belongs to nobody. Yes. Except the parishioner. Yes. And he's really faithful to it. And if he doesn't have a eunuch face, which I'll explain, I'll explain to you what I mean by that, then he becomes special. You see, it's a funny thing about celibacy art. Let me just give you one small word on it from a celibate. That, I mean, either you practice celibacy and it becomes a positive thing, or else you're like somebody who's wearing a, a chastity belt and somebody's thrown away the key and you're looking for the key. <laughs> you know, it's, it's, uh, there is a eunuch face. I wish I could say I relate, Father, but I'm I'm the kind of guy who sits and thinks, uh, how can it be heaven without sex? Well, <laughs> uh, well actually, you know, <laughs> maybe I, I understand you completely, my God. <laughs> marriage is a beautiful thing, and love is a beautiful thing. Uh, by the way, the uh, the most impressive thing in exorcism, the most disgusting thing, the most uh, the most chilling thing in exorcism, apart from the malice, is the terrible demonic contempt for human love. Yes. Oh, God. Art, you have no idea what it's like. I mean, the contempt... Well, it would be the greatest enemy, wouldn't it? Of course. But the contempt for human lovemaking and human marriage and human love, uh, the contempt is... is, is is wounding. It wounds you when you come across it. So there's actually, in, in, in a possession, there is a lot of sexual... Of course. ...perversion. Of course. And there's always a basis for it in reality. And any weakness that the exorcist has in that matter is brought out. It's like an old scar opened up with a whiplash. Well, celibacy cannot be an easy thing. No. Not, not for a mortal man, not even a no, priest. No, it's not. It's not. And it's, it's, by the way, it's not a sudden thing. It's a thing developed over a lifetime to make it a joyous thing. And, and not that you're a sports sport and go around with a beatific smile. No, it's not that. It's, it's a different thing. Father, Father uh, we've done it again. Uh, we're at the oh, top yes. of the hour. We'll okay. be right back. All right, back to uh, Father Malachi Martin. Father, a couple of quick uh, fast yes. questions, and then we'll yes. go to the phones. Yes. All right. Uh, here it is. While testing for exorcism qualities, has Father Martin ever found a person who was psychic themselves or had powers of telekinesis, the ability to move things uh, physically, that was their own power that just looked like demonic abilities, or are all psychic powers demonic? 
And, uh, listen, it may sound like a trite remark on my, on my part. That is a very interesting question. And the reason is this, that uh, there are three plateaus of reality. There's the physical reality, which we all know, space, time, the, the dimension in which we live and move and have our being. Right, right. There is the supernatural reality of God. And there is the middle plateau, whereon the demons exercise their gifts and whereon those with psychic gifts uh, have perceptions that baffle the rest of us. And where they are able to move. And where I, they're able to move. I remember Eb, Eb, Major Ed Ames, this uh, remote right. viewer that I have on from time to time, came on the program with you. That's right. And it's a very dangerous plateau because it is very fascinating to move on that plateau and it can involve you with demonic activity and become fascinating. Now, people with natural gifts of psychic perception, uh, people that know things from afar, people that know your past life, mm -hmm. um, people that can, uh, 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 can, uh, can enjoy telekinesis, can do that sort of thing. You just said people who can know your past life. That's right. I uh, I would have thought your position would have been that there ha there are no past lives. Well, no, I didn't mean past lives. I meant what has happened since you, uh, for instance, you're 45. They oh, will know oh, what happened to oh, you. Oh, 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 I see. All right. uh, not reincarnation. No, 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 no. All right. So there, there is real psychic power. Oh, there is real psychic power. There's no doubt about that. And it's a very, very frightening thing when you meet it. And I've known young people, young boys and girls with it. And uh, you have to teach them to uh, how not to use it. <laughs> Uh, because it disturbs people very much. Uh, and then besides, it can also lead them onto the middle plateau where they can run into trouble. All right, part two of this is a separate question. Yes. People have predicted the current pope will soon die, yes. after which another pope will take control. Yes. The new pope has been predicted by some to be a dreaded betrayer of the faith possibly involved in the coming of the Antichrist. Yes. How does Father Martin view the prophecy of the 111th Pope, which would be the next Pope? Um, frankly, Art, uh, the older I get, the less I know about it. I have a feeling in my bones that the miseries of the Roman Catholic organization, as an organization, not simply as a spiritual church, but as an organization on the face of the earth, the miseries of that organization are just beginning and that it is heading into a very difficult situation hmm. worldwide um, and that there will be a lot of trouble in Rome itself uh, now as regards the health of the present Holy Father it's very hard to know because he is a, a Polak he a is. stubborn man. Oh, he is. And he keeps on saying, no, I'm, despite all these prophecies, because he hears them, all these doomsayers, I'm going to see the year 2000, and I'm going to go to Mount Sinai in the year 2000, and I'm going to go to Ur of the Chaldees, where Abraham started in the year 2000. I'm going to go to Jerusalem and Bethlehem and Calvary. Well, if he's determined, then he may well make it. He may well make it always take into account the will of God um, uh, we do I do not know uh, frankly I in spite of my name which is biblical uh, for a prophet Malachi I have no gift of prophecy art so I don't know mm. I I have a great confidence that God who so loved the world that he sent his only begotten son to give us light and, and light uh, will take care of us but I don't think it's going to be easy I think misery is going to start. Father, you predicted uh, that there would be an event in the spring, that there would be an event... There uh, could be. There could be an event if, if, uh, if a certain sign took place. But there was no sign between the uh, end of spring and the end of... the end of winter and the end of spring. There are, nevertheless, many, many people, and I'm one of them, who feel something big is imminent. Oh, yes. 
there is, there's no doubt about that. There's no doubt about that. Um, people of all disciplines. Uh, people I interview of all disciplines, uh, and they're all essentially saying the same thing. It's a general feeling. Yes, no it is. About that. It absolutely is. And remember, you remember what Freud told us about what the psychiatric associations in Austria were saying just prior in 1938? He said that the multiplicity of patients coming, telling about dreadful dreams about barbed wire and blood. Yes. Uh, he said it baffled us all why they were talking like uh, there is a general feeling, and I, I uh, knowing the future doesn't help one's peace of mind. Art, <laughs> <You know? laughs> and uh, I remember I had the the dubious privilege of reading the text of the Third Secret of Fatima, which I must guard by oath from repeating, but it isn't pleasant. I have a whole stack of faxes here asking me to ask you about that, and you obviously cannot speak of that. Not factually, not word for word. I can't. I took a note. But it ain't pleasant. And the less you know about it, the better. Except that there is going to be a reckoning, and that uh, nobody existing on the face of this earth will be exempt from knowing uh, the power from on high. They will interpret it in different ways. That according stands to, their, to reason? According, yeah, according, according, to their to their, according to their beliefs? That's right, and their culture and their bias. And uh, there will be people who even faced with the, with the certainty that there is a greater power above our heads will say... They will deny it. They will. The scientists. They'll, they'll reject it. The scientists, for example, will find a scientific explanation <laughs> for will. it. They will. They will. Remember the, the famous so called Aurora Borealis in 1938? Well, uh, I, I certainly am aware of Aurora Borealis, but not one specific one. There, there was a specific one which they explained by saying Aurora Borealis. It really wasn't that at all. They all agreed it wasn't Aurora Borealis. The only one who put his finger on it was Adolf Hitler. And he Great said, say. and he said what? Well, he was in Bachter's garden at the Wolf's Lair. That was his famous uh, place when he for, for a weekend with his cabinet. And Speer, Albert Speer, who was a member of his cabinet, his architect, tells us in his second book that that night they all stood on the esplanade of his villa mm -hmm. in the Bavarian mountains, looking out to the east and seeing these extraordinary sights of light. And Hitler said, yeah, nun, now we have to shed blood. We didn't shed blood in taking the Tsar, we didn't shed blood in taking Czechoslovakia, but now we're going to shed blood. So he took that as a sign. Oh, he took it as, as well as a sign. Because the virgin who told the children in Fatima in 1917 about this sign, she told them it would take place just before the Great World War, she said um, it will be just before they start killing millions. Can you tell us in a way that we can read between the lines with regard to the third prophecy? Um, is there is there a timetable that you are aware of that cannot speak but cannot speak of that we can read between the lines on? Uh, yes and no. There is. A, it is not 200 years away it is not 50 years away it is not 20 years away number one well that's and number two it involves the entire world system it's not merely one area it's not merely one religion it's not merely one race will be apparent to all all without exception without exception and it will be frightening okay well I think I've asked as much as I want to ask about that <laughs> let us uh, well, ask some asked. questions of the audience uh, first time caller line you're on the air with Father Malachi Martin in Manhattan hello uh, good morning and uh, greetings to you Art uh, from British Columbia up in Canada and to uh, Father Martin good morning uh, kind of still Maliki 
Uh, uh, see. <laughs> we, keep, you garlic. we do try to keep the faith a little. <laughs> <laughs> but listen, uh, several. Uh, what I'd like to do is ask several questions, and I'll just hang up and listen to your various responses. One for Art, and two for Father Martin. All right. Several weeks ago, uh, you had a living, breathing astronaut, Art, on the program. Yes, Edgar Mitchell. Yes, I rather wish you'd asked him if, in, what his take was on your question. Uh, did we really fly to the moon? Okay. That was oh, I, 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 look, uh, he, yes, the answer is yes. I've asked him that many times, and mm -hmm. it's always absolutely, he walked on the moon, sir. But did you uh, sort of challenge him with some of the questions that the debate raised? Yes, I did. Uh -huh. Yes. I'm sorry, I missed it. Father Martin, yeah. uh, my Irish grandmother, God bless her soul, uh, yeah. <laughs> when she I'm had me... How far did she come from? Um, she was from uh, County Court. Oh, God bless her. Yes, I know. <laughs> she used to have me on her knee, and with a twinkle in her eye, she would ask, uh, tell me stories about the little people. Uh -huh. And as a kid, I loved those stories. Uh -huh. I cherished them. But, uh, you know, I, I would like your take on that. Uh, the little people? The little people. And the other question is, uh, Father Martin, uh, you mentioned Vancouver as a source of the black arts. I think it's yes. Victoria is even more so. Yes, it is. Yeah. Do you mean the mild-mannered Canadians? Oh, hey, man. Oh, hey. <laughs> <laughs> Aren't you a very charitable person? <laughs> <laughs> well, I mean, in a lot of ways, they are. Canadians, I speak to them all the time, Father, and they yeah. are very mild-mannered. Very, they're very courteous. There's no doubt about that. But apparently behind that, that facade, <laughs> why is it? Anyway, uh, those little people... The little people, well, the little people, it's, it's the ancient uh, Celtic myth that the, the fairies, the little, little people, the wee people, uh, dwell in the ruined forts and castles, of which Ireland is full, by the way, uh, ruins of chapels and churches and towers and castles and, and old houses, etc., but it is purely and simply a Celtic myth. But around it, they have wolves and an entire literature. I wonder, Father, if today's little people in America and the world yes. that are called greys, aliens, yes. are the same sort of mythological creatures that uh, th that were in uh, Ireland. I have always wondered the same thing, Art, and I have no answer to it at all. I have no answer to it at all. Uh, there is a, a greater myth, or not myth, but mystery in Ireland, the Banshee. Hmm. Did you ever hear of the Banshee? I've never heard of the... Oh, I've heard of a the Banshee. The Banshee is that certain families, certain old Celtic families still existing in Ireland, when a prominent member is dying or dead, this woman is heard crying. Hmm. And it's too frequent a happening to deny it. We don't know what it is. I had a very, very irate uncle on my mother's side who was a, uh, who became an atheist, by the way. And when I brought this up to him, he said, no, that's the female hair in heat. <laughs> but it wasn't. It's too, it's too established, the fact that there, there are families and there's this peculiar wailing and oligoning, as they say in Gaelic, at the death of the member. I tell you a pretty strange story, Father, in Miami. It broke the day before yesterday. A woman dressed entirely in black with no identification whatsoever yes. fell from the sky. The authorities have checked with um, airlines, with uh, flight plans that have been filed, blah, blah, blah. No identification on the woman. They have no idea who she is. She literally fell from the sky, hit a picket fence, was cut in two, Good God. and they still have no idea uh, what whatsoever uh, what that could be all about. Um, Signs, strange signs from the sky. Strange signs, but there are strange things happening all over the place, Art, at the present moment. No uh, Paducah, all... Paducah, Kentucky, a 14-year-old walks in and kills three classmates, uh, wounds six others, and gives only as an explanation, those who know him, that he was angry at us, at society. Oh, boy. Oh, boy. Oh, boy. Yeah. You know, you see statistics today indicating that crime, violent crime, is down. But the very nature of crime has utterly changed. At one time, Father, when one person would take the life of another, there usually was a reason man catches. 
man catches a, a, a wife in bed with somebody else, or robbery. bad business deal, robbery, whatever, but there was a motive. Today's crime, though maybe less, is totally indecipherable. To totally, you're quite right. That's the very word, indecipherable. It's an extraordinary turn of events. Now, look, uh, as far as I know, it means the presence of a more active evil for evil's sake. Is there a war between heaven and hell that is constantly going on, or yes. is it... and now it's acute. Now, now it's, it's acute. acute. Now it's very acute, yeah. All right, once again, Father Malachi Martin from Manhattan. Father, a war, yes. a war between heaven and hell. There have been recent movies about it, and so I hate to have to draw my knowledge of this um, from uh, motion pictures. Why not? Uh, but uh, there was... Uh, have you seen a movie called Prophecy? Yes, I have. Christopher Walken. Yes, right. Boy, he sure is a perfectly possessed person <laughs> on screen, isn't he? <laughs> um, it, it, in those motion pictures, depicts an actual war between heaven and hell, an escalating war between heaven and hell. Right. Uh, the fallen angels. Um, when you see something like that, uh, is that anything like you envision to be uh, going on you know, minus the Hollywood special effects. Yes, well, minus the Hollywood special effects, yes. The, uh, yeah, it is. Uh oh. Of course. We're, we, we, we just had some weird noise on the line. We had, yes. It must be the. <laughs> we're getting on somebody's nerves. Yeah, that's right. But you guys at NSA, the, just listen, don't cut in, huh? <laughs> that's right. The, the, it is, yes. It's, it, but the. the where you find that battle raging is in the souls and lives of living people. Uh, and you find it raging and hurting and injuring and killing. The people you deal with. Yeah. Yeah, you do. And um, terrible things happen. Uh, humanly terrible things happen mm. to people who... Uh, take the other side who really serve evil and hurt others um, and they, they, it spreads from generation to generation it's a terrible battle and it goes on all day and goes on right through the whole week and the whole year and there's no getting away from it and it's getting it's getting much more acute today than it ever was before us well we maybe this why. is a dumb question but is there any possibility that that war could ever become an all-out war, one in which um, the right side wouldn't win, where Earth could be lost? Uh, I think it can get to the point that Earth can be lost for a while. It will be reclaimed. But I think that there's a, a sunset is creeping over the whole human thing yes. at the present moment. And it's it's a grey sludge, and it's slowly but surely extinguishing all love. The world is really getting very cold. And I think we're now getting back toward that which you really can't fully talk about. Yeah, that's right. <laughs> <laughs> that's right. I, I catch on quickly. All right, Father. Um, a lot of people on the phone lines, and I've really got to get okay. to them. East to the Rockies. You're on the air with Father Malachi Martin. Hello. Where are you, please? Hello there. Hello. Yes, you're on the air? Yes, this is Bruce from Chicago. Hi, Bruce. Hi, Bruce. Uh, good morning. It's an honor to talk to Father Martin. He's my favorite guest. Hi, Bruce. Uh, my question was uh, along the lines of what you were just talking about uh, the last moment. Uh, yes. In Father Martin's last uh, appearance on the program, uh, he talked about, uh, or you, Art brought up the lights in Phoenix, and yes. Father said that uh, if that in fact was the case, something awesome and most fearful would be happening, and the time frame I uh, interpreted from that was somewhere uh, out to spring of 98, and I wonder if he could uh, specifically elaborate on the time frame if he can't go into well, detail. Well, actually, I, I don't feel happy at all about uh, 98 the moment we leave winter and start into spring. I don't feel happy at all about it. Uh, uh, Can you... Uh, I simply think that things are spiraling in such a way that uh, we're going to undergo severe disturbances, to put it mildly. 
nationally and internationally. Uh, I, I, I think that uh, if I were to be awfully frank, I think a lot of people are going to die violently. Um, oh boy. I think we're coming to a very bad point. A very bad point. I think. Uh, uh, I, I can't interpret it any other way. All right, I don't even want to ask anymore. Uh, west of the Rockies, you're on the air with Father Malachi Martin. Hello. Yes, good morning. Morning, where are you, morning. please? Uh, close to Vancouver. Yes, Vancouver. <laughs> <laughs> Again. <laughs> we draw you forth. Yes, you have. God bless you, Vancouver. Art, uh, I appreciate your ability to uh, sensitively talk to the variety of people that you talk to. It's amazing to me. And uh, Father Malachi, uh, you're, a, you're a very special person. I have a question for you. Yes, sir. That's been very uh, disruptive to me. A little while ago, I was leaping through some very old photographs of my family. I came across two pictures that were taken, it looked like a few minutes apart. Yes. Uh, my mother, another woman, and a young child yes. uh, in front of a, a fence with a house in the background. The first picture, they were all looking very sullen, very glum, and in the foreground, in front of my mom, there was a creature uh, that you could kind of see through it. It almost looks like double exposure, except that there's no reason. It, this picture's too old and, and, and genuine. Yes. Uh, but the creature looks about four feet tall, a little hunched over, black kind of shawl, uh, very kind of like a, a big nose, very, very evil looking. And uh, I'm concerned that this could be demonic, and I'm concerned about the intergenerational kind of effect that can have on an apartment. Yeah, yeah. Was there any trouble in Was there any trouble in Have you got the picture yet? I have got the picture. I don't even show it to people because uh, it, yeah. it just it no, don't. Makes, makes my hair stand on end. Yeah, don't, don't, don't. Um, put it in an envelope mm -hmm. and write the... Are you a Catholic at all? I'm, uh, I'm not Christian. Catholic. I'm. You're Christian. I am. I am Christian. Well, then take an envelope, put the photograph in it, and put a notice on it saying, "Do not open," and date it and sign it, and write the name of Jesus across the front of it, and put it away. Okay, do not open, and then write. Uh, write the name. name of Jesus and put it away in a strong box somewhere. Um, it has a purpose. It has it has a purpose. I don't know what the purpose is. Um, is that is that is that a clear enough instruction? It is. Uh, how about if I send it to you and you could put it in a strong box? Uh, I don't uh, even want it. Well, if, <laughs> if, if if that is to be what's to happen to it, please do. Okay. Um, if that is to be the way it's done. Okay. Do. But I, you, I, I, sir, really should accept responsibility as guardian of your own. <laughs> I've, I've had it up to now. <laughs> uh, is there an address that I can get? All right. Yes. Uh, thank you. Uh, let's, Father. Uh, by the way, I want to tell the audience uh, you have a new website, and we have linked to your website. I should have given this much earlier in the program. If people will go to www.artbell.com. And just scroll on down to Father Malachi Martin's name, click on it, you will go to his new website. Now, right. Father, is there a way on that website for people to contact you? Um, uh, Maybe not, huh? Not so far, although I must tell you Art, that I've given out an address, a postal address in Manhattan. Yes. Uh, which can be used with impunity. Yeah? All right. And it's 217 East 66th Street. Just slow down. 217 East 66th Street. Street. New York, New York, 10021. 10021. Apartment 2A as in Apple. Wait a minute here. Uh, I, then I download all my messages, uh, my email, right. continuously. I don't answer them all because sometimes they, they exceed 300 a week. I understand. And it's difficult to answer them, but certain ones I do. Okay, Father Malachi Martin, apartment 2A. Uh, as in Apple, yeah. Uh-huh, uh, 217 East 66th Street, New York, New York, 10021. USA. Okay, uh... East of the uh, Rockies, you're on the air with Father Malachi Martin. Good morning. Um, hello, um, 
Where are, where are you, please? Um, I'm, in, I'm My name is Alex, and I'm calling from El Paso, Texas. Yes, Alex. Hey. Um, yes, Father Martin, I have yes, a feeling that my a good friend of mine, his son, I think, may be possessed. Ah. And he, what he does is he draws very, very strange drawings on his wall, and he talks to them. He draws very, very ugly pictures of of certain strange things, and I have a... Now, I may sound like kind of crazy by saying this. No, you don't sound crazy at all. What age is the boy? He's about 10. Ah. And, you know, when when kids are about 10, you know how they have, like, invisible playfriends and stuff sure. like that. But, um, you know, I have a strange feeling that, that God is telling me to, like, kind of help this boy. Yes, has... And, and I don't really, like, know whether to, like, you know... You had like some sort of help on exorcism or anything like that? Yeah, I, I, I do not know the bishop down there if there is an official exorcist in that diocese of El Paso, in which El Paso is. Um, tell me, do you know anything else about the boy? Is, does he does he speak he bends about, himself does like he speak about a, Does he speak about a companion? Well, he tells me that he's talking to the person on the wall. Yeah, he draws these these yeah. figures. In, in other words, he could have a familiar, as they call it. Um, I'm not too sure about a familiar, but yeah, well, um, they, they call it a familiar. Mm-hmm. Um, but I, I, at this distance, it's impossible to say. But the the peculiar drawing is funny. Um, does his father ever bring him to a psychologist? It's just um, no, he actually the father just kind of like blows it off and says, "Hey, you know, um, it's just my son." Doing strange things, you know, but oh, gee whiz, that's a bit. I, I kind of have a feeling that you know maybe I should get someone, or if, if not myself, get someone to exercise him. So where would I? I well, would... the, you have to apply to the local diocese, mm-hmm. because at this distance, it's the jurisdiction of the bishop in which El Paso is. I don't know what diocese El Paso is in. It's in a Texas Texan diocese, Texas mm-hmm. diocese. I don't know which one. But then you go to the chancery and ask who is the exorcist in that diocese. Would it be if, possible? If the father agrees, because the father must agree. So there you are. Uh, 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 father, what chance in this modern day and age in America uh-huh. does somebody have of going to a diocese and getting an affirmative answer that there is an exorcist? Very uh, well. It put in percentiles about 33%. Thirty-three, thirty-three. About a third. It's, it's, it's very low. And very if low. if they don't get satisfaction, then what? Wow. If they don't get satisfaction. Yeah. If if they're laughed off or uh, yeah, shrugged or off they, or whatever. Yeah. I, I I the reason I I groan is that I know so many cases of that. I know so many cases where they're laughed off or brushed off or told to go away or simply told us no, go to a psychiatrist, you know. Uh, And that's what has happened within the church organization of my Roman Catholic Church. Um, If if our friend who's speaking to us from El Paso, um, he should pray about it because prayer can obtain what this boy needs but I have no solution at this distance Art I have no solution I I see the poignancy of it all and the danger and that father is very feckless Father could you become a bishop? Of course I could If you were to become a bishop with yes. the, the, the the power ascendant Yes What would you try to change? What would you try to do with that increased responsibility uh, I would try and organize um, the clerical reaction to possession and obsession because these are factors that are growing in every diocese I know in the United States so we should not be offering less to people like that man who called, but no, more. no, on the contrary, it should be aided immediately. There should be a mechanism in each diocese that aids such a thing, takes it in, studies it, uh, gets to the boy, gets to the father. But there isn't, and that's the triumph of uh, 
Luciferianism, um, the church themselves. As the, as the grayness descends. Yeah, and the, the terrible thing is that you won't find a belief in it all amongst many bishops and many priests. Mm -hmm. Does that uh, does the fact that you just said that yeah. make it uh, less likely that you would become a bishop? No, no, it doesn't. It depends on the will of those who make bishops. But uh, anyway, the, the, but the, the, it is pathetic art. It really is pathetic. Um, even in this archdiocese of New York, there are people who need attention, but they don't get it. But don't get it. Because there's just too much to be done. I understand. First time caller line, you're on the air with Father Malachi Martin in Manhattan. Hello. I, I can barely hear you. Yes, my name is Keith. I can barely hear from two. Yeah, you're going to have to yell at us, sir. Okay, um, my name is Keith. Yes, Keith. Uh, yes, Keith. I'm, I'm calling from Carbondale, Illinois. Okay. Yes. Um, uh, I was just calling um, in concern with something that you uh, talked about earlier in the show, the... Uh, the lady named Harlot. Oh, yes. And um, I was just thinking about it. I do a paper route at night, and I just got off of it to try to get a hold of you. And um, I, you seem kind of concerned, and it hit me that uh, most likely the, the daughter would be um, in heaven. And the reason I say this is because um, if the woman desired her to be in hell with her, yeah. um, and hell is supposed to be a, a damnation, yeah. then um, she wouldn't be able to have that with her. I mean, it would uh, like but, 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 sir... She said, if you listened carefully to that program, she didn't say that she willed her to be in hell with her. She said she took steps before her daughter was killed to ensure that she would be in hell with her. It, it, it's as if she desired that to be. Of course. It was beyond and, and, desire. She right. said she took steps. Right. And what I'm saying is that um, she would be getting one of her desires fulfilled if if God were to enact um, the child to to damnation, yes, but you, you you really are missing something. Though she actually took steps, and what I asked Father Martin a while ago was whether I and I have no idea what those steps are, but whether it would be possible that in fact she could have done that, and the answer was yes. It's, fe it's feasible. It's feasible. Hmm. The the case. It's an extraordinary thing. The genuine. Luciferians and Satanists you meet, they look forward to hell. I, she did. She absolutely did. It was it was one of the most unnerving uh, interviews I've ever done in my whole life. They really do. Father, uh, we're at the top of the hour. Are you good for one last hour? Certainly. Well, there's lots of people are waiting, so we will do it. All right, uh, back now to Manhattan and Father Malachi Martin, and Father will try and lay heavily into the phones. Yeah, sure. But... I do have a couple of quick questions um, by fax. Yeah. One, have you, Father, ever had an exorcised demon come back to haunt you? Yes. Oh, really? Yeah. Now, I'm glad they asked because I never would have thought to ask and I never would have expected that answer. Can you tell us at all? Uh, yes. It's very harrowing. And... Um resulted in bodily injury, grievous bodily injury. Um, but it, it, we were able to deal with it, uh, but it took a lot of a lot of work and it involved a lot of physical pain, a lot of physical pain for a whole year. For a year? A year, yeah. The damage. Oof. Mm -hmm. uh, and uh, one other... And this is much lighter, finally a light question. Mm. You know, we're talking about Christmas and Christmas giving and so forth. Yes. And uh, we know that you have been close to two popes. That's right. And uh, Kevin, listening to KEX in Portland, wants to know, what does a close friend of the Pope buy him for Christmas? Uh, well, if he really knows him, and he knows he shaves, does he use an electric razor? Uh -huh. It's as simple as that. Uh -huh. uh, or uh, slippers, bedroom slippers, uh -huh. uh, or um, if he uses T-shirts, one pope did, oh, mind you, use T-shirts <laughs> and valued cotton, Egyptian cotton T-shirts, things like that. I see. 
simple things. Simple things, sure. Okay. Uh, all right, first time caller line. Uh, you're on the air with Father Malachi Martin. Good morning. Hello, this is Ken from Steubenville, Ohio. Hi, Ken. Yes, Ken. Uh, praise God, I finally got through to you, Bell, after trying for months. Yes, sir. Uh, first of all, I'd like to confirm two things and then ask a question for Father Martin. Mm -hmm. A, yes, once you've been demonized or bothered, getting rid of it is the greatest thing in the world. Yes, they do try to come back and bother you. I know, I had death delivered off of me. Mm -hmm. Second of all, uh, I have a question for Father Martin about, uh, is it possible that a person could be born and have a curse put on them uh, for the rest of their life, where like a cloud of doom is always over them? Interesting question. Yes. The, the only way I can translate it into reality is that uh, in certain families, possession is intergenerational. Right. All right, the reason why I asked that question is last year my mother died of cancer. Uh -huh. And uh, we had to bring her home to die. Uh -huh. And I knew of a, uh, well, she said she made a deal with God, and I knew what it was. It was a pact. And uh, she didn't die in peace until I prayed over her, anointed her, and broke the pact with the devil. Yep, that can be done. I know. She, she... I've done your type of work, and I understand the seriousness of it. Uh, so as far as this curse goes, uh, oh, I've had many people pray over me, but nobody could really put the finger on why. Are you one of the people who has a black cloud over his head all the time? Yes. All right, uh, Father, that really is an interesting question. Your answer was affirmative, that there can be such a, in a, in a I don't know if curse is the right it can word. Be. No, curse is not, it's a, it's a way of saying it. But it's an intergenerational obsession, really, in his case, that he's not possessed. It doesn't sound like it anyway. It seems so cosmically unfair. If there is no such... You know, I listen to and I interview people who believe uh, fervently in reincarnation. Yes, yes. And they will uh, forward the theory of uh, karmic work-off, you know, yeah. that uh, from yeah. one lifetime to yeah. another. Yeah. Yeah. But if there is not that, and that we, we all begin roughly equally, it just doesn't seem fair... Well, you know, sometimes we don't all begin equally uh, at that difficulty. And, see, there's one peculiarity God has, and it's this, that, as the prophet Hosea said, the fathers eat sour grapes and the children's teeth are blunt. Um, take, for instance, Adam and Eve. I wasn't in the garden. True. I didn't eat the apple. True, but you nevertheless suffer. Uh, but I suffer from that. That's God. If I am, if I am a child born of a mother who's a lush and a father who's a crack addict, yes. Most probably, I'm going to be an alcoholic, and I'm going to be crack addict from the from the moment I see the light. Why? It's this way God has arranged humanity, huh. and if I have a parent who rears me to be uh, the servant of Lucifer and I know families that do that oh yes uh, you know God doesn't step in and send an angel and tell me to stop uh, I've got to deal with it and if there's anything like anything like uh, an intergenerational obsession in man's family then he has to deal with it all right. Wow. East of the Rockies, you're on the air with Father Malachi Martin. Hi. Hello. Going once. Going twice. Mm -hmm. I'm not from the Rockies. Uh, uh, I said east of the Rockies. Oh, east of the Rockies. I'm sorry. <laughs> That's you, then. You're east. Where, where are you? <laughs> I'm in, uh, I live in Oak Lawn. Oak Lawn. Oh, Oak Lawn, Illinois. I'm sorry. De name... Definitely east of that great chain there. <laughs> definitely is east. <laughs> Good morning, Father. Good morning to you, ma'am. Uh, first, before I ask you anything, I want to thank God that we have priests like you to yeah, give us information. I'm to hear that. I, yeah, well, we, for the information that we're starving for, for our uh -huh. so, uh, because you speak the truth. <laughs> and this is what we very seldom hear nowadays. Okay, uh, my question, or uh, and I have even written this to Cardinal O'Connor in New York, uh -huh. could the tampering of the Latin traditional mass of the saints and the martyrs, uh -huh. let all hell break loose. 
Now, the reason I'm saying, that's my first question. Yeah. And the reason I'm putting that together with, I read the um, uh, Leo the Thirteenth when he had the, uh, heard the devil come from yes. the tabernacle. Yes. Yes. And now, I don't know, I'm not trying to figure out God's time, but that was in 1887. It was. Right, Father? It was. Okay. So it was in 19... Now, the first thing they did at Vatican II when they tampered with the Mass is take away the prayer of St. Michael. That's right. And, I mean, is, I, don't, I don't look at it as coincidence because it no, was... No, it's not in, coincidence. Pardon me, Father? It's not because they took Father, away... you, uh, Father, you've got to stay good and close to the phone. They, they I took... have to. My, my phone is in bad shape. Oh, okay. I'm going to get a new instrument. And, and, and when he heard this, when he heard the devil make the, the pact with God, now if I'm saying it wrong, I'm not real well educated, so bear with me. You're doing fine. Okay. Well, when he made that pact with God, and God said, I will give Satan a hundred years to destroy the church. Yes. Now, when that happened in 1887... And the my, prayer to St. Michael was composed to fight the devil. The first thing they did at Vatican II is take away at the foot of the altar the mass of, of St. Uh, Saint, uh, not the mass, I'm sorry, the prayer of St. Michael. That's right. All right, all right. You already covered that, ma'am. And I know, so okay. Your, your bottom line question is, is, okay. is all hell about all right. to break all right. loose, right? All right. The thing I'm asking is that in 1987, through the grace of God, the Holy Father, almost to the day, the month of October, on the Feast of St. Therese, the, the Mass indult was given. Now, that is like the weapon, the center of our faith, is the Latin traditional Mass. That's right. Now, That's right. Could, could this be all part of it, the tampering of the sacred? That's what I want to know. Right. Yes, it was. It was. And uh, it, between you and me and the Holy Spirit, ma'am, what I've always believed is this, that the only punishment that that was merited by those who drew up the main documents in the Vatican Council, the only punishment that they deserved was the withdrawal of grace. They tampered with the truth, and God simply withdrew grace, and hence we had the horrible 30 years. Do you understand what I'm saying? Uh, clearly, uh, yeah. Father. Uh, west of the Rockies, you're on the air with Father Malachi Martin. Hello. Yes, hello, Art. Hi, where are you? In California. This okay. is Daphne. Yes. Um, thank you for bringing Father Malachi on. Um, hi, Father Malachi. Hi there, ma'am. How are you? Fine, thank you. Um, What's on your I... mind? Pardon me? What's on your mind? I have two questions, if I can. Sure. Um, the first one... Um, deals with, um, I was born into an intergenerational satanic cult, uh-huh. and okay. my father was the high priest. Yep. Um, I was, um, at my birth, my soul was given to Satan by my parents, yep. and so my first question is, how can I be released from that? Uh, very simple, uh, uh, ma'am, mm-hmm. um, provided you are baptized, yes. and that you go to confession, Holy Communion, and Mass, um, you should, on the Feast of the Immaculate Conception, which has just been a couple of days' time, mm-hmm. you should um, consecrate yourself to Our Lady. Okay. I did denounce Satan. Um, is it as simple as that? It's as simple as that. Okay. Um, if you need anything further, uh, you could write to me about it. Okay. But uh, that's all that's necessary, really. Okay, and thank you. Um, my second question is, um, as a result of the experiences that I had with this cult, I developed um, multiple personalities, so this uh-huh. whole evening um, program is very interesting to me. Yes. Um, I was highly programmed by the cult, and I've been in therapy for many years, along with um, all the personalities. Um, our nine demons, they're not part of my personality, but they're separate. Yes. Um, my pastors are preparing to do a deliverance. We, I'm not Catholic. We did go to a Catholic church uh-huh. and ask the priest, and he he really did not believe in that. And he, he, he did not. He didn't he did take not. it seriously. Um, so my pastors are preparing 
to do this in a few weeks, and I'm wondering if you have any suggestions for them, or is there a way they can reach you by phone? Um, write me a short note to the following address. Mm -hmm. 217 East 66th Street, mm -hmm. apartment 2A for Apple, mm -hmm. New York, New York, 10021. Okay. And does that come directly to you? Or yes, or? it does. Okay. Yeah, obviously, that's an apartment address. It goes right to it. Yeah, tell you. me your first name, so I will identify it. Uh, on the envelope? No. Just it's in the uh, letter. Tell me. Uh, Daphne. Okay. What is your first name? Daphne. Daphne. Daphne, okay, I've got it. That's enough. All right, Daphne, uh, do that then. Father, yes. that is an amazing thing to hear. She was given to the devil at birth. Oh, yes, but this is, you how have much no idea how common this is. Uh, well, that's what, that was where I was going. In America, in Canada, in, our, in the Americas, um, even worldwide, Father, how much of that is there really going on? I'll put it like this. It's going on, I don't know, one country in which it is not going on. I don't know one, because there's a, there's a very private Vatican report about this, which uh, we don't divulge. But it has gives the indications that this there isn't one country in which this doesn't take place. Um, is there is there um, arguably more of it going on, or yes, yes, arguably more going on today than ever any records indicate. That's the records we have, and the records are very good, are very detailed. Um, but the, arguably there's much more today and in the last 50 years the last the second half of this century has been a bumper crop so that really at the very moment in history a critical moment when the church ought to be going in the direction that you would have it go it's going exactly the other way that's right the organization not the church itself because that's a that's a sacred thing it's composed of all those in the state of grace who belong to our Lord and to God, but the organization itself is in shambles. Shambles. In shambles, and is uh, to a large extent dominated by Lucifer. East, uh, dominated by Lucifer. East of the Rockies, you're on there with Father Malachi Martin. Hello. Hello. Where are you, sir? Um, Erie, Pennsylvania. Erie, uh -huh. okay. Wow. Um, I didn't really expect to get on. Um, I could ask questions for hours, too, but, however, I'll just try to cut down to, like, three. I want to ask Art one question. Yes. Uh, Art, why yes. do you divide your callers between on, on the Rocky Mountains? I would have thought the Mississippi River would have been a more central location. <laughs> well, <laughs> maybe, uh, maybe we'll change that one day. Uh, mm -hmm. It's just something we did because we began in the West and we had... So many people in the far west that were listening to the show when it first became syndicated that we wanted to give everybody east of the Rockies an opportunity to get in. And uh, the show has grown, obviously, since then. So maybe we'll change that. I see. Anyway. Okay, and a question for your guest. Um, okay, I tell people that uh, people that uh, go seem to go crazy and just shoot people for no reason. You know, uh -huh. uh, like just recently somebody shot a, a bunch of kids at the... Paducah, uh, Kentucky. Paducah, right. Kentucky. Right. And um, I tell them, well, this, you know, there's no real reason for this. These people m must be possessed. Uh, you're probably the only person I could talk to that would agree with me. Um, do you think that at least a percentage of these people are actually possessed or obsessed or... Or is it just normal human evil? No, no, no. I, 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 I'm convinced that in a case like the Paducah thing, it's a demonic origin. It was a prayer group. Yep. A prayer group. And this young fellow was warning people ahead of time that something horrible was going to happen. He actually warned them. Yep. And then went ahead and did it. It's, it was... It's... It's... As I said earlier, indecipherable. So you believe that there is possibly, very possibly, real evil involved? Yes, and the the, the, the difficulty we, the normal public have is this, that, for instance, in New York, when something takes place, something horrid, something bloody, something murderous, 
and the Satanism, as they call it, as a general term, involved, the police will not tell that to the public. They have a rule. They have a rule. Then I, I must ask you this, Father. Uh, this, in the, in the Paducah case, of course, it was a 14-year-old child, and this child will be no doubt charged as a juvenile at 14, but yes. if, if this was a, an older person, yes. then how many people do you suppose, Father, go to the electric chair or are ultimately punished, ca receive capital punishment yes. for something that is of demonic origin rather than human origin? That's difficult to answer. Um, I know that when we did a survey of prisons, uh, lifers, and people confined for uh, 30, 35, 40 years for horrible crimes, a good one-third of them were obviously uh, possessed. A good one-third? Yeah, at least one-third as a general ballpark figure. One-third. All right, Father, hold on. We're at the bottom of the hour once again. Still there? Yes, sir. Well, Kay, we're in the stretch run. <laughs> <laughs> it, it really is amazing how time goes. It, it, it runs away, Art. It uh, runs away. Yes, sir. First time caller line, you're on the air with a guy who runs away with time, Father Martin. Hi. Hi, this is Paul in Denver. Hello, Hi, Paul. Paul. Father Martin, I have two short related questions. Yes, sir. Concerning your comments about hypnosis, yes. if someone is pursuing uh, or, or is not pursuing metaphysical goals or satanic goals, yes. is hypnosis in general or self-hypnosis in particular dangerous? I know many people uh, use self-hypnosis for self-improvement kinds of purposes, mm -hmm. and I, I just ask, is that dangerous? No, of itself, no, it isn't, but it should be under the supervision of some good psychiatrist. I see. And, and then the last kind of related question is, how is a, um, a, a self-hypnosis different, or maybe it's the same, as an affirmative prayer? Uh, uh -huh. Because the self-hypnosis is really uh, relying upon uh, your own inner powers of concentration. Yes and uh, self-control whereas uh, prayer genuine prayer depends on a special gift from God I see at the moment of prayer they so are the thing, thing. they are they are father presently doing studies uh -huh. on the power of prayer actual scientific studies mm -hmm. and it would appear to be absolutely scientifically verifiable mm -hmm. that the power that prayer actually works. Yeah, it does. It works. There's no doubt about that. And the, the question that Paul just gave us is very interesting. Yes. What is the difference between self-hypnosis... Precisely. Uh, because actually you can be taught uh, by, a, by a, a very well instructed uh, psychiatrist they can teach you to hypnotize yourself so that you go to sleep so that you recover from weariness so that you you know but how does that differ from prayer in the sense it differs in one sense one essential sense that prayer it is genuine prayer and if it's heard which it normally is by a good God um, then it means you get extra help uh, spiritual help supernatural help and that's distinct from your own inner powers Wildcard line, you're on the air with Father Malachi Martin. Hi. Hi, it's Tom in Reno. Hi, Tom. Hi, Tom. Um, Father Martin, it's a distinct honor to speak with you. That's very nice of you to say that, Tom. Thank you. Um, I was wondering if you were familiar with Edgar Casey. Yes, I am. And... With his works, I never knew the man himself. Okay. And when you knew that he was uh, an extremely religious person. Extremely. Um... How do you, how do you reconcile his um, his writings about uh, past lives and that sort well, of thing? I'll, I'll tell you, uh, Tom. There's no doubt about it. Two things are clear about Edmund Casey. First of all, he had extraordinary middle plateau powers. Mm -hmm. That is, uh, psychic gifts, extraordinary. 
Yeah. It's quite extraordinary. There's, there's at least one doctor in New Jersey today that still uses his formula, his formulae, for various afflictions and diseases. And uh, he did this without any medical instruction as such. He had extraordinary perceptions in that thing. An extraordinary uh, perception. He just had it and it came to him. It was a, a psychic gift. On the other hand, he did make egregious errors intellectualizing his condition. He fell into various sort of illusions about about God and about life and death and the hereafter. And that part, if you were wise, if you take my advice, you'd drop his, any teachings he has about that. But uh, his, there's no doubt about it. I know a person, a lady, who, a woman who was, whose sight was saved because she went to a doctor in New Jersey who used Casey's formula. He did have some amazing uh, he did, formulas amazing. that he came up with. Utterly amazing. And it was a gift. There's no doubt about it. Now, look. I knew a few people in Ireland, the old Ireland I was born in, in the 1920s and 30s, who had extraordinary gifts, too, of curing, healing by touch, and who also could tell you what's going to happen to you on the morrow. These gifts, and I've met them in various parts of the world I've lived in, but never so much in my youth and adult when life was much simpler. Um, these gifts exist, there's no doubt. Edmund Casey is an outstanding example okay, of extraordinary yeah. psychic gifts. Definitely well, great gifts from God, I would yeah, say. Yeah, obviously. Anything good comes from God. Okay, I have one more question, if I could. All right, one more quick one. Okay, I was, I wondered if, if it's, you think it's possible that your, you could be wrong about um, past lives and reincarnation. All right, uh, there's a straight out question. Well, no, I don't think there's such a thing as reincarnation. I just don't believe it, because my church condemns it, and my reason uh, doesn't accept it. Uh, now that I can be wrong, one can, one can always be wrong, Tom, you know what I mean? But on this point, since it's a matter of faith, I prefer to say, no, I'm not wrong, I'm following the truth as revealed. That's because I'm a Roman Catholic. Fair enough. Uh, east of the Rockies, you're on the air with Father Malachi Martin. Where are you, please? Hello? Hel Hello there. Hi, I'm in Brian, Manitoba, Canada. All right. Uh, I had a question for Father Martin. Yes, sir. Hi. Um, have you ever heard of the house in uh, Amneville, New York? Yes, I have. I've been to it. You've oh, been yes, to I it? have. Really? Yes. Is it, is it, are the people living there right now? Uh, for a long time, there weren't. There may be people there now. I just wondered if um, you you had any any information on the person on the on the son who who did the the deed in that house and if wh what he's doing now. No, I don't know what he's doing. I, I wish I did. Oh really? I have no means of following that up because he's he doesn't want much notice. Mm -hmm. he's got enough notice about it all. Um, is it true about the well in that house? That yes. Is that yes, true? It, it, they, the Amityville horror was really horror. It really was. But they were just as bad and worse. We found. Okay. Yeah. Okay, thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, the Amityville horror was real. Oh, yeah. Uh, it was real. It was genuinely gruesome and real. And, uh, but, yeah, it was very unpleasant. Do you think that, that whatever was there is still there? I, I'd, be, I'd be inclined to think it is there because it was never properly cleansed. Well, well, I'll, I'll, be, I'll be doggone if I'd move into that house. <laughs> <laughs> Neither would I. I'd be doggone, too. Uh, no, I wouldn't move into a place like that at all. West of the Rockies, you're on here with Father Malachi Martin. Hello. <clears throat> Good morning, Father. Um, I have something that has been bothering me for about a month and a half now. Yes, sir. And it occurred when I was in bed laying on my side. Yes. And I was tapped on the shoulder. Yes. And I turned my head up towards the, over towards the bottom of the bed, and there was a big, dark entity there. Yes. And he was grabbing me at my feet. 
in this, trying to pull me. Is this the first time this happened to you? Yes. Um, how long did it last? Uh, it lasted, it seemed like, for 20 seconds. Has it occurred again? No, it hasn't. Okay, do you practice any religion? Um, no, I don't. Oh. Uh, well, I'll tell you, um, might be a good idea to pray, because, uh, unless it, I don't think you were drunk. No, I was not. No, I'm sure you weren't, I say that. I don't think you were. You sound very sober, in my mind, I mean, in judgment. Um, then this is what we call a, an obsessional harassment. It's probably a great mercy that it's done to you, because it may wake your soul to to worship God. I do believe in uh, Jesus Christ, and good. But this has ex been extremely bothersome of myself. It should be. I'll tell you. Um, have you got a pencil? Yes, I do. Write down. Go ahead. Oh, creature of God. Uh huh. In the name of God who created you. Okay. And in the name of Jesus who saved me. I exorcise you. Now, drop all fear. You have nothing to be afraid of. Thank you. But Thank you. those words in its eye. Okay? Thank you very much, Father. God bless. Good luck. Um, first time caller line, you're on the air with Father Malachi Martin. Hello. 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 I'd like, I'd like to know if I could uh, uh, talk to, just, just leave uh, Father Malachi a uh, number to call me toll free. Off the air. No, I, I have no way of doing that, sir. I'm here all by myself, and um, there is no producer to sit here and take a number. Mm. I just a one man band show here, so I can't do that. But you can write to the father. Yeah. Okay. Okay. That's what you're going to have to do. Thank you. Uh, wild card line. You're on the air with Father Malachi Martin. Uh, good morning. Good morning. Morning show, Art. Nice to see you, Father Malachi. Thank you. Where are you, sir? I'm in. Gulfport, Mississippi, WVMI territory. Uh -huh. Very good. <laughs> um, the question, Father Malachi, I have yes. um, in reference to the to war, the war, the eternal war. Yes. <laughs> what do you believe in reference to the Nephilim or the Nephilim in uh, as far as returning in the flesh? Yes. With the adversary to deceive the world, like before, ta da 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 da. Uh, uh, like the locust army, that kind of thing. Yeah, yeah. yeah the Nephilim, yeah. Uh, uh, half uh, angel, half human. Yeah. No, that, that would be the Giba. I thought it was Nephilim. Yeah. Well, well, it depends on where you look, I guess. <laughs> <laughs> if you read Sitchin, it does. It depends on where you look, and it depends how you interpret where you look. Um, I, I only know one thing. That the Nephilim, Nephilim and the Giba and all that motley horde are under the domination of our Lord and Savior Jesus. And we have nothing to fear, provided we remain faithful. Was the earth not once cleansed uh, with flood to, to correct all that? Uh... It was. Actually, what you and I live in today, Art, and um, our friend uh, from, from uh, wherever he is, is speaking from, what we are living in today is a reformed creation. It's something God made over again after the fall. Uh huh. Uh, kind of like he hit a reset button. Yeah, he did. Uh, he, yeah, he had to reset the whole darn thing. It went awry. I have. I've uh, again just sort of a reference to what we've been discussing all night, yeah. brushing up against it again. But it looks yeah. to me like the fingers get near the same button again. Yeah, they do. They yeah. do. <laughs> they do. Uh, they do. East of the Rockies, you're on the air with Father Malachi Martin. Hello. Uh, yes. Um, Father, I have a question for you. Yes, sir. Um, in college, uh, a friend of mine and I befriended a, a, a third um, um, guy in mm -hmm. one of our classes. Mm -hmm. And we became friends, and um, he revealed to us at a later time that he was dealing in the black arts. Uh-huh. And... Um, 
Mm-hmm. Because of this, the friendship broke off. Yeah. Um, did, did you deal in it? No, no, I didn't. But, um, but we had some carryover, if you will. Uh, yeah. We were visited by things that weren't very pretty, and uh, that's right. You, there was insect. We called that infection. Okay. Um, well, that we had, and we dealt with it, and we confronted him about it, and he didn't believe that it was possible. He thought he was in control of these. Uh, demons and such. That's the usual persuasion. Right. Um, we tried to convince him to get out of it, and he believes that he can't. And um, he believes that there's a, um, a hell waiting for him, and that there's sort of at this point nothing he can do about it. Now, we don't that's have not commu- true. Excuse me? That's not true. Well, I, I don't believe so either. Yeah. Um, but we don't have communication with him anymore. Oh, Lord. But, um... Pray for him. Yes, is there... I, I do that. Is there anything specific I can do? Uh, beyond reaching him and getting him to go and see uh, somebody in authority who can influence, help him, deliver him, heal him, no, except prayer. Okay. But you can pray for him. Okay. And uh, it can it can move mountains. It really can. Okay. But throw in a little fasting and penance. Fasting and pants, okay. Yeah, throw in a little of that. All right. On that. Okay. For his sake. Try and get to him, though. All right. All right? All right, thank you. You take Here's care. Your, here's your brother. Uh, west of the Rockies, you're on there with Father Malachi Martin, and not a lot of time left. Yeah, Hello. Hi, Art. Anna calling from Malibu. Uh, Malibu, all right. Yes, I'm a student of Elizabeth Clare Poppet, and yes. I'm just saying that as a point of reference, that's not the reason for my call. Yes. Because I know you had interviewed her recently. I did. Yes. Um... Uh, Father Martin? Yes, Lizzie. I'm calling concerning uh, Jack, Dr. Jack Kevorkian. Yes. And I have a very strong oh. opinion about him. I think that he's doing a terrible disservice and that I, I believe that the patients that he is killing um, are not being relieved of their suffering, that um, somehow in an afterlife, because of my spiritual beliefs, I believe that there will have they will continue to have to go through whatever the whatever they need to go through, and um, it just so happened that the break he was on the news again saying that um, he's trying to recruit other doctors to do this, and I think you've developed a good rapport with the listeners, and I would like to invite you to perhaps do a service to the listeners and um, voice your opinion and perhaps uh, give. Further, your further opinion. Yeah, I wish we had more time for this. Uh, thank you, ma'am. Uh, Father, it we is really, more time. it we really is a good topic. Uh, but what, yes. what is your opinion? Uh, there's no doubt about it. Jack is doing the work of the devil. Um, about his actual spiritual condition, I don't know, but I know that he's doing directly the work of the devil. He's sending people into eternity by means of what is a mortal sin, an offense against God. Uh, you can't do that with impunity. And um, that's about his actual spiritual condition. I don't know him from a hole in the wall. I wouldn't recognize him, you know. So I don't know. But he's doing the work of Satan. There's no doubt about that. Your opinion, murder? Yeah. He's, he's murdering their souls, really. Their souls, really making it easy for them to... And the, the dreadful thing about it, the dreadful thing about it, Art, is that uh, when he goes into eternity himself, where on earth do you think he's going to fit, except in one place? I don't know. Will he meet the souls of those he dispatched? Um, God only knows, but one speculates that yes, he will, but in a very warm place. Mm. But, I mean, he, 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 he is doing the work of the devil, there's no doubt about that. Boy, I hate to imagine that those souls that he dispatched, uh, those suffering souls... Well, you see, yes, you're right, Art, you, you have a good compassion, Art. It may be that they were suffering so much that they lost their reason, do you understand me? They, were, they grasped at any straw. I do, but... Uh Maybe. The good doctor retaining his health, you don't think that uh, he's got the same chance? I don't think so, no. I'd be very condemnatory. 
Well, uh, Father, we've done it again. We're flat out of time. Uh, I know. The time is the one thing we capitalists can't buy. Uh, uh, <laughs> Listen, I want to thank you for giving me the chance to talk to you and to your audience. And um, if I don't speak to you before Christmas, you and Ramona have my blessing. Father, thank you, and uh, we will do this, of course, again. So it's not goodbye, just to Please, next time. No, no, it's au revoir. Good night, Father.